Thank you for doing this, Jay. And let me begin with um, the first thoughts of being a lawyer that entered your head. When did when did that happen? Uh, I, I know that your father was a lawyer. Yes, and that you was. had a high school teacher that was uh, very much a mentor. Uh, I did. Uh, my dad was a small town lawyer in a sizable town in North Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey, and uh, did uh, virtually everything, all different types of law from corporate to personal injury to workers' compensation. And he would come home and, and discuss his matters and... Um, I took a lot of interest in, in uh, what he did. It became the family business because my brother uh, likewise followed in his footsteps. Decided, older brother? Older brother, brother, six older brother. years older, who practiced law with my dad for a number of years. Um, between my first and second year of law school, I too joined their practice um, and uh, had worked on some interesting cases, um, race discrimination of a prominent banker, um, uh, I'm sorry, a prominent doctor in town who was discriminated against in getting a loan. I found it a fascinating case and it opened up the world of, of uh, race discrimination under federal statutes. And uh, the only problem was uh, on Friday afternoons, my brother and father would come and announce that they were going to the racetrack and I was never invited to go along. So I knew that my career was going to take a different turn than practicing with them. Your, your older brother had taken that spot. And <laughs> he had. It was, um, uh, it was a monopoly that I was not going to family practice that I was not going to easily undertake. Yes. And... Um... I know that between high school and, and coming to Cornell, you had some time in Europe? Was, I did. Talk about that? Um, and, I was in a backward school system that graduated on the half year. So I graduated high school in January, had all my um, uh, applications in, just waiting for the April news as to where I would get in and where I would go to college. And in the meantime, worked at the Public Service Electric and Gas Company until... Um, uh, I was invited by the, the New York Herald Tribune, the old New York Herald Tribune, to join its um, first adventure in Europe. They brought a group of students over from Europe uh, for many years, and they called it the World Youth Forum. And this was going to be their first adventure um, in taking U.S. students, mostly from the eastern seaboard, northeast, um, to Europe um, and uh, for a six six week period, living with families and traveling around and poking our nose under the industrial tent of, of post-World War II Europe. I won the prize. Uh, I, I won the trip by um, uh, performing well in a competition that they had that was broadcast on, on uh, public television. And you came to Cornell. And then I came to Cornell. I was very fortunate. Now, I believe I'm right that you entered the College of Arts and Sciences and then swam against the tide uh, over to ILR. Can you talk about what prompted that, that switch? Yeah, it was very interesting. I was interested in government, and history, and economics. Uh, uh, when I entered the Arts and Sciences, I had never heard of any of the state schools. I guess I did not do my research well in looking at Cornell. I was out of state, so there was state. no reason to. And um, uh, it was a time when the labor movement was helping to craft the way um, society reacted uh, and, and uh, the way industry reacted to society. And um, as an avid newspaper reader, I, I had taken a great interest in, in um, industrial relations and as it related uh, or as economics related to industrial relations and, and government related to industrial relations. And consequently, um, I, um, I decided that I would better, uh, that the ILR school, once I had uh, researched it, would better suit my educational needs. And also, quite frankly, uh, there were money issues. Um, uh, my father uh, had uh, suffered a severe injury and, and was unable to work for a long period of time. And the tuition was a lot less than the ILR school as well. Even for a New Jersey citizen. Even for a New Jersey guy. 
So I went in to see Dean Brown, who was the Dean of the Arts and Sciences School to explain to him uh, uh, about my move. Actually, I was summoned to his office and um, it, he was an imperious guy. Uh, uh, his office was in Goldwyn Smith Hall. Um, it was a relatively dark wood paneled office with a couple of Tiffany type lamps on his desk that provided the only lighting. You have a sharp memory of that. I sure do. Because the, the um, uh, well, what, what Dean Brown told me was that I was destroying my life. I would, I would never amount to anything were his words. Um, and uh, by moving from the arts and sciences school to what he felt was an inferior education in the industrial and labor relations school, um, I'm afraid he was dead wrong. Uh, so here I am today, a rather, a rather successful in life attorney who was educated by the ILR school and then by Cornell Law School. Were there faculty members in ILR that were particular magnets? I mean, I know Milton Convitz had his very popular undergraduate. Course. Milton Convitz was wonderful. Um, I can't say he was a magnet for my going. Yeah, it was yeah. really the subject matter sure, that, that sure. attracted me. Uh, but once I had Milton, I know I had... I had chosen the right place. Um, Milton taught a course called American Ideals in the ILR school, though he also taught uh, back then in the law school as well. Um, and in American Ideals, he explained how cultures of various countries and religions around the world really helped frame the way Americans look at themselves and react to democracy. And that was just so enlightening. We hung on every word of his. Um, uh, he was perhaps the foremost professor, uh, uh, most formative professor that I had while uh, an undergraduate. He, he drew from across campus, right? I mean, yeah, he that, did. That course. He did. And um, uh, I really can't say with assurance that uh, how many students were from other colleges, but there were a number. Um, including, I assume, law school as well. His American Ideals course um, uh, is one that struck many, many undergraduates who I meet as alumni today and are mm -hmm. very, speak of, of Milton in a very fond way. Mm -hmm. I even have a, a CD that someone presented me of his lectures and seven of his books, which I've, I've read over the years. So his lectures are captured in audio or? Uh, they were captured um, in audio, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, were made into a CD that a professor presented to me about 10 years ago. Well, this is an aside, but we ought to have that in the, in the archive share it. collection. I have it in my office yeah, yeah. Um, and it'd be very easy to, to ship sure, up to you, sure, Peter. Sure, sure. Um, now, as you came to the end of this ILR experience, you were pretty firm you wanted to do law. I was. Uh, and the only question was where. Exactly. And um, what caused you to say you're going to stay in Ithaca? Because I, th I think many of those so disposed when they come to the end of ILR or other parts of the undergraduate courses at Cornell say, well, time for change. I. Uh, there were a number of us who stayed, not, not a large number, we're mm -hmm. talking maybe six mm -hmm. uh, who stayed, and um, most of them were from ILR. It was Charlie Recklin who was first in our class in the Cornell Law School mm -hmm. who came from mm -hmm. the Arts and Sciences School. Um, the reason I decided to stay, I always wanted to practice in the New York City area. Mm -hmm. um, I've always loved the city and and I knew I wanted to practice labor and employment law. Actually, back then it was just labor law. Right. And the employment side was was um, of a more recent origin, um, uh, but New York City was the main attraction. So I figured to get the best education possible, I wanted a a monk like existence, and that's what Cornell Law School. You uh, couldn't. You couldn't. To, you couldn't be a, a monk in the in the metro area. You could not be a monk in the metro area. I, I knew there'd be too many distractions, and I just wanted to dive in and learn the law, which I certainly did at Cornell Law School. So um, it it was my premier my premier choice. And back then, 
um, you know, my undergraduate years at Cornell, as well as my law years, uh, were right in the middle of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to be sure that you got um, a, uh, uh, a JD, you had best go straight through. Not, not, not break. Not pace not, at all. Yeah. Not break your pace because you'd be, be you drafted. would be uh, drafted immediately, um, and so uh, uh, not that that's a reason to go to Cornell Law School, but uh, a reason um, to go straight to law, straight straight through to law. Um, and I had a friend from Patterson, a few years older than I, whose father was a judge, uh, and the friend was at Cornell Law School, and and um, my good friend Ira Shepard and I came over and took a look at the place, and it was just gorgeous. How could you pass up going to a place as as absolutely gorgeous as Cornell Law School was physically? And of course, we heard about the level of teaching and and what what uh, types of courses we could have. And the last reason was being interested in in labor law. I had had Kurt Hanslow as an undergraduate. I was going to ask about Kurt. And um, uh, I knew of Walter Ober, um, although he did, while he, he held a joint uh, position as professor in the IOR school and the law school, Walter uh, really taught in the, uh, in the law school. So I was looking forward to that as well. Mm -hmm. Had you taken a course with Kurt? In, I did. Yeah, in, in the uh, ILR school. In the ILR school. Right. Loved it. Right. Indeed, I. I'm told that I did the best Kurt Hanslow impression uh, in my undergraduate uh, class and maybe in my first year law class as well. I'm tempted to ask you to do it now. I'm not going to do it, Peter. <laughs> uh, but he had a unique uh, presentation skill uh, that um, kept everyone's attention. And even though he, uh, both he and Ober were reported to be very pro-union, they presented a very balanced um, uh, view of labor law. And it was kind of interesting uh, between my, well, my second year when I was interviewing New York City firms, I interviewed with one particularly conservative large firm in the city. And the um, head of the uh, labor department at this firm called me in uh, late afternoon on Friday when I was just about done with all of my interviews and sat me down and explained to me why Cornell Law School had gone to the communists. And this was largely because Kurt Hanslow and Walter Ober taught there. And wasn't I aware of this? And I tried to, def to defend, and I think I did a pretty good job of defending the um, uh, even-handed way that both of them taught at, uh, at Cornell Law School. Um, he wasn't convinced, and uh, I did not get an offer from that, from that law firm, which was for the best. And, and that was because they were perceived to be pro I mean, Kurt, they were that perceived was Kurt's to be background. Pro, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Kurt, in particular, was, was perceived to be uh, so pro-union. But this... Um, uh, rather senior partner, termed him communist. I never mm -hmm. saw anything in, in Kurt's mm -hmm. background or his teaching that would tell me that he was mm -hmm. um, a, a left-wing fringer um, at all. Indeed, most of the work uh, that Kurt and uh, Walter Ober did was with the, e uh, the uh, Auto Workers Review Board, um, where they would um, uh, decide cases that involved uh, whether the auto workers versus another union in the AFL-CIO should be representing or should be, um, had jurisdiction to represent particular groups of, of workers. Now, obviously, they, uh, they felt for the union movement. Um, I, I, uh, in all my work with them, both in the classroom as well as a, um, uh, an assistant, a teaching assistant uh, to them, um, I never got the feeling, though, that mm -hmm. they, they were left wingers. Uh, well, the, the the school you were you came to as a student um, was at that point deemed by uh, Ray Forrester toward correct. the end of his his career. Uh, Bob Summers was fairly new, right? Bob Summers was uh, I think that we had my section 
of uh, procedure had um, Bob Summers as a visiting professor. Right. He was marvelous. All right. Um, other sort of sharp memories of, of the faculty of that time? Well, you mentioned uh, Billy Ray Forrester, the dean, right, right. Uh, who uh, I, uh, I, had, I had Billy Ray for constitutional law. And uh, again, I know I've used the word marvelous a lot, but he truly was. He was so soft-spoken. Um, many of my classmates, including myself, uh, at first, thought that we were going to be taught by a Southern bigot, mm -hmm. uh, someone who uh, perceived race relations in, in a way that uh, we did not, uh, at least in my little group, turned out to be totally false. Um, his um, his soft-spoken Southern manner uh, belied his strong views of the Constitution and, and of equality. Um, that uh, made me very proud to have had him as a, mm -hmm. as a professor. It also turned out that, and I didn't know this until years later, his daughter was a classmate of mine in the class of 68 as an undergraduate, and uh, I bump into her every, every now and then. Mm -hmm. He was a marvelous teacher. Yeah. Um, but, you followed the law school very closely in the years since, and I'm curious how you would compare the experience you had as a student here to what you know students are experiencing today? I mean, so what are the major differences um, as you would I think, think the, back on it? The students today are more imaginative, they're more worldly, um, and they're, I think they're more inquisitive than we were when I was in law school. Um, Today, my impression is that there's more of a dialogue between professor and student than there was when I was a, uh, a student. And that's largely because of the inquisitive nature and the outgoing nature of the students is uh, maybe at a higher level today than it was back then. Uh, you expected your faculty when I was a law student to be instructing you and pulling in the Socratic method, pulling information out of you and, and making you think uh, harder and deeper as did prof uh, uh, Professor um, Schlesinger in particular, Rudy Schlesinger did. Um, uh, today my impression is uh, students um, treat the law school experience a little lighter than uh, we did when we were in law school. All for the better, mm -hmm. all for the better. And have more personal voice in the classroom. I is think that's, yeah. that is yeah. correct. That's a good yeah. way of putting yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, at the same time, the woman who was to become your wife became your wife. She sure did. And um, and you want to talk about? Oh, that? absolutely. I love talking about my wife, <laughs> Harriet, and I met at a summer camp where we both happened to be counselors. Um, uh, between uh, freshman and sophomore years as an undergraduate at Cornell and uh, dated. Um, she was not a Cornell. She student. was not a Cornellian. She was from Brooklyn College, a science major, totally different outlook in life. Mm -hmm. And having grown up in a, in, in a family that was law oriented, it was refreshing not to discuss law with, uh, with Harriet. We discussed social policy, mm -hmm. certainly, but um, uh, she became the love of my life, and um, we were married between my first and second years of, of law school. She, um, she truly helped put me through law school. She taught at Ithaca College hmm. and um, biology and uh, 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 helped pay my way through law school with a little help from my parents and also a lot of help from uh, Dean um, Warren. Uh, in the law school, who um, uh, surprised me one day, met me in the hallway and said, Jay, uh, there's money for you to continue your law education. Wow. So. Uh, and, and the cost of legal education in those days were uh, order of magnitude. Oh my goodness. The, it, uh, well, both undergraduate and law education, right, right. Um, I think it may have been $1,200 a semester, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I seem to recall that number. 
you know, today I was talking with some, some parents in, in uh, Manhattan who were explaining to me that their grandchildren are, are uh, well, their children are paying some, some uh, $40,000 a year to send their grandchildren to nursery school uh, just to, to, uh, to put, that. put it in perspective. Right. Um, but it was a lot of money back yeah. then, yeah. especially when you had, to, uh, you had your living expenses and uh, Harriet was just marvelous. And so did you carry indebtedness out of, out of legal education? I did not. Yeah. I was very fortunate yeah. to, um, uh, through Harriet's earnings and through my scholarship and earning some money during the summer months um, at Cave Scholler where, where I uh, was a summer associate. Um, I did not leave with any indebtedness, and I'm just so thankful for that. And I've tried to pay back the school and the student body over the years in a modest way by establishing a scholarship. Um, the path to K. Scholler, I mean, um, you did a summer clerkship yes. between second and third year. I did. And, and uh, was the placement office uh, a major factor? I mean, the placement office was great yeah. in the sense of attracting wonderful law firms, large, small local firms in the upstate area, as well as New York City and uh, around the country, uh, attracting them to Cornell. Um, and I had a number of interviews and was, was asked to uh, have second interviews. But my heart was really set on practicing in a major firm that had a labor law practice. And I explained this to professors over in Hanslow, and they, they thought that uh, Kay Scholler would, um, would be perfect for me. Kay Scholler did not interview at Cornell at the time. Mm -hmm. I wrote them a letter and explained my interest. Never heard from them. And while I was down speaking with the law firm that uh, made it clear to me that Cornell was a communist institution, um, I uh, dropped the, I think it was a nickel, in the phone in the in the phone booth on the corner and called the hiring partner at Case Scholler and um, his uh, his secretary. After a long delay and maybe another nickel or two in the box, um, came back on and said that uh, Mr. Bullen would see me if I could come in the following the following Monday morning. And so I cut classes and went to see Case Scholler the following Monday morning. And uh, the rest is history. Uh, they were impressed that uh, Ober and Hanslow were impressed with me. And uh, um, uh, I wound up spending 43 years of my law career at K. Scholler. Between your graduation from law school and K. Scholler, though, you, you clerked for Judge Inja Wyatt. I did. Uh, and, and how did that come about? That was another wonderful Cornell Law School experience. I'm not quite sure how I was called to the attention of Gray Thoron. Had, but you, had you taken a course? With no, Gray? I don't think Gray was actually teaching at the mm -hmm. time. And um, he, uh, he asked if I would come to his office. I knew he was a rather imperious character, at least he seemed that way, uh, to, uh, to law students. Um, and he explained that um, he had understood that I was interested in pursuing a clerkship with a federal judge, that he had carried Inzer Wyatt's bags at Sullivan and Cromwell when uh, Judge Wyatt was then head of Sullivan and Cromwell's litigation section, uh, that he had heard some good things about me and would I be interested in clerking for Judge Wyatt. And um, my suspicion is that uh, Walter Oper had something to do with it, but I never really asked nor found out mm -hmm. uh, exactly who had called me to um, uh, Professor Thorne's uh, attention. Um, and um, uh, Gray spoke with uh, Judge Wyatt and um, the judge said I sounded like a good prospect according to what Gray told me. And um, uh, he set up an appointment for me to meet with Judge Wyatt uh, a couple of months later when I was in the city, and um, I landed the, uh, the clerkship thanks to the interest of, uh, of Gray Thoron. Um, one thing I did learn about uh, Professor Thoron was that um, uh, not to overstay your visit with him because when he felt that his 
discussion with you was over, he uh, had a habit of taking his hearing aids out of his ears, uh, unscrewing the cap so that he could take the batteries out of the hearing aids, and then he would very carefully place the batteries and the hearing aids in his drawer, the top drawer of his desk. At that point, you knew that your audience was over and you immediately thanked him and left. No, ambi heard, no ambiguity there. No ambiguity, and I doubt he even heard the thanks. <laughs> but he was a wonderful, a wonderful mentor in that mm -hmm. sense. And mm -hmm. we became somewhat close over the years, uh, visiting with him whenever I came mm -hmm. back to Cornell. Uh, Shall we move to your experience as a lawyer at Kay Scholler? Oh, right? sure. Uh, you uh, began as an associate and... Worked very hard as an associate, yeah. and uh, uh, as most associates did. Back then, uh, the law firm was about 125 lawyers by the time I joined it in 1972 after clerking for Judge Wyatt for a year. And um, uh, I did a variety of work. Um, it became apparent to me that I wouldn't just be doing uh, labor work, mm -hmm. and uh, back then, you didn't get assigned to a department until you were there for six months or a year. So I did, did a lot. Did you rotate of, around? You amongst? rotated around. Um, you were invited to sit in with the tax department for one of their lunches, where they would call out numbers. It was sort of like bingo. They would call out numbers, and you'd hear the whooshing of tissue pages um, as everyone flipped through to uh, to the appropriate section of the code or the rules, um, and. Uh, then would shout out the answer in, in the tax group. Uh, that was not for me. Um, uh, but I did a variety of, of, um, uh, of research projects um, for uh, antitrust, uh, corporate, uh, some labor and employment, and ultimately was accepted into the labor uh, group which was then run by Fred Livingston, who was also the head of, of the firm. Had a lot of fun uh, with Fred and his partners traveling around the country, largely doing labor negotiations, but also some work before the National Labor Relations Board in connection with cases um, that arose from, from uh, representation hearings as well as refusals to bargain in, in the, across the bargaining table. Ours was a management side practice with one exception. Uh, in public employment, Kay Scholler had represented the um, uh, National uh, Education Association, the NEA, when it was still considered a professional association and was in competition though for membership with the American Federation of Teachers, um, newly formed uh, but catching on very quickly. And uh, the uh, partners in Kay Scholler's labor department helped to turn the NEA into a labor union. And also one partner in particular, Fred Bullen, who was an undergraduate graduate of, of uh, Cornell, um, helped the NEA merge their black and white locals, their separate black and white locals in the South. Um, then they, then the firm though, um, began representing school boards, which is around the time that I, that I, uh, joined it. Uh, but shortly after I joined Kay Scholler, um, the labor department was, uh, retained by the New York City police unions to, um, first establish parity in pay with their counterparts in the fire department, and later, in an effort to break the parity relationship in pay between the police and principally the sanitation union. Back then, Mayor Wagner, uh, for political reasons, had decided to pay the sanitation men 10% less than the police officers. And because of overtime and other benefits that the, that the sanitation men got, um, uh, they actually were paid more than police officers were paid. Uh, in the middle of this huge case that went before a three-person arbitration panel 
to try where, where the uh, police try to break parity, the city's fiscal crisis hit. You may remember the headline, Ford to City Drop Dead, when the city asked the uh, federal government, uh, President Ford, for, uh, for some uh, financial assistance. And um, uh, consequently, um, uh, while we did break parity, it was, um, it was a short-lived victory because of the city's fiscal crisis. But if you fast forward, I always stayed interested in politics in the city and, and in um, the um, relationship of the city with its police. And fortuitously, uh, in 1999, uh, the, the uh, police union um, approached me about representing it in an effort to uh, bring its um, pay scale up because it was at a competitive disadvantage with the pay for police officers in surrounding communities as well as throughout the United States. Indeed, when you adjust for cost of living, New York City's police officers were being paid, uh, in some cases, some 40 to 50 percent less than many communities around the United States. Um, and as a consequence, uh, for, the, for some 14 years, I represented the city's police union. It, uh, it, it's a public sector representation. Mm -hmm. My private sector clients, which largely on management side, uh, never objected. And I had a lot of fun um, because uh, of, of the work they do, the police mm -hmm. officers do, and, and my feeling for them. Man, I wound up increasing their pay over those years uh, through a series of these interest arbitrations um, well in excess of 50%. Uh, today, they still are some 20 to 40% behind the neighboring communities because these communities also have increased the pay of police officers. But nonetheless, they're in better shape today than they were back in 1999. Um, you mentioned interest arbitration. I mean, yes. a, a strong thread in, in, in your career is uh, is ADR. Correct. Uh, could, could you talk about how that has uh, certainly has worked its way through your work? Well, the, it, it began, of course, when I was an undergraduate because in studying labor unions and collective bargaining, one of the mainstays of dispute resolution is not the strike. Um, very few, uh, very few um, uh, collective bargaining disputes are resolved by the, uh, the employee striking it, it is as little as 1% of collective bargaining disputes actually wind up in, in strikes in the United States, but through uh, grievance arbitration. Um, and uh, that, that's, uh, I guess, started my interest in dispute resolution and how it, it could uh, serve the interests of labor management, but also uh, eventually, how it could serve the interests of uh, commercial um, in, in resolving commercial disputes as well. Uh, when I became a partner at Kay Scholar in, in 1980, uh, I um, uh, became interested in a group called this, the what was then the uh, Center for Public Resources. Today, it's known as the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution. And if you look at the uh, uh, the initials of both uh, the old name and the new name, they're both the CPR. So today it's known as the CPR Institute. And um, uh, this was a, uh, an institute that was funded um, through corporate contributions to study and improve methods of dispute resolution through mediation, through arbitration, through fact-finding and hybrids. Um, uh, to, to keep disputes out of the courts. Uh, and uh, uh, I took a great interest in as, as um, the employment laws grew in number and uh, employment cases, uh, the number of employment cases began to clog the courts. Ways to resolve these disputes through um, uh, alternative means rather than through court litigation. Mm -hmm. It was um, a fascinating experience because 
back in the 80s and into the 90s, it was, it was sort of a novel, a novel um, movement towards dispute resolution. Uh, at my law firm... The phrase mini-trial comes to mind. Well, mini-trial is... Yeah. is yeah. Uh, uh, a mini-trial could be before a judge, actually, um, or a magistrate judge, but it could also be before an arbitrator where... Uh, basically, you stipulate your facts or you have a, um, uh, a script that's read into the record of, of what certain witnesses would testify to if called to testify. Uh, Cross-examination would be waived. And then you might have on each side one or two actual witnesses uh, comprising the mini-trial. But basically... But it arose during this period, right? It, it arose during that period. Yeah. It was one of those dispute resolution mechanisms that became rather popular. It still is today. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing, um, at least at Kay Scholler, and I know from discussing this problem with others who are interested in ADR uh, and other particularly large law firms, the litigators... Um, saw ADR as uh, a minor practice area. They wouldn't mm -hmm. deem to touch it. Uh, litigation in the court was the only true way to resolve disputes. Today, it's rather different. Some of the biggest cases that uh, law firms handle are in arbitration. And so in mediation terms, and mediation has become a mainstay of dispute resolution, uh, whether you're in litigation or, or um, uh, just trying to resolve the dispute to avoid litigation. So within the structure of the firm, um, who was doing ADR if the, if the litigators saw it as uh, not their business? Basically, it was the Labor and Employment Department yeah, that was... Yeah that was doing, my department, that was doing ADR on a regular basis and uh, became the, um, the source of information about this, this uh, oddball practice area of, of uh, alternative dispute resolution. That started to change in the late 80s, mm -hmm. um, particularly when seasoned lawyers who had entered the political arena started to retire and went to uh, and found a place as special counsel to law firms. At Kay Scholler, it was um, uh, Abe Ribicoff, a uh, mm -hmm. former senator from Connecticut, uh, former, uh, former and the final Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare as, as a, uh, um, a department uh, that included health, education, and welfare under. President Kennedy. Um, and when Abe joined Kay Scholler, um, uh, he was retained as uh, an arbitrator in a number of cases and would call upon me to help him with this, uh, to figure out the novel way that he would handle these cases because he knew nothing about arbitration. Um, he had been a trial lawyer when he was in private practice in Connecticut before he became uh, interested in politics, first as governor and then as the HEW secretary. Um, so the practice for, of, of ADR for many years really resided in the Labor and Employment Group, even though slowly but surely um, a number of litigators became interested in the practice. And at the same time, um, the Labor and Employment Group was always a crossover group because we helped our corporate partners fashion dispute resolution um, uh, uh, provisions of the corporate deals and financings that they were involved in. And many times uh, these ADR mechanisms would work their way into executive employment contracts that we would help our corporate partners with as well. So we became the crossover group that, that uh, uh, helped uh, raise the awareness and interest in, in alternative dispute resolution. And there were times then, I guess, when you needed to litigate. Oh, absolutely. Uh, look, I, um, I think that I've, I've been very successful in court, largely in getting cases dismissed um, on the employment side, uh, but also, which included uh, 
representing clients in uh, disputes over restrictive covenants um, and not just uh, disputes involving uh, the civil rights laws, mm -hmm. um, but also on the traditional labor side where we'd be before the National Labor Relations Board or in court in connection with uh, trying to um, uh, stop a, a labor uh, strike. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the um, now, now I've lost my train of thought as to how I got... Uh, well, I was asking about you and litigation. But, uh, yeah, so um, uh, most of the litigation that I did over the years uh, was on motion to dismiss and, and motions for summary judgment rather than trials. Um, occasionally there'd be a trial, a bench trial, not a jury trial, mm -hmm. though. So I was, again, the oddball at, uh, mm -hmm. uh, at Kay Scholler anyway. Um, uh, but by getting cases dismissed early or else channeling them into a mediation process, I think I serve the public good and uh, as well as my clients' best interests. And of course, you have to discuss these things with clients. Risk mm -hmm. management is, was and is a very important uh, um, subject that you discuss with your client early on in the middle of a case and towards the end of a case mm -hmm. to be sure that there isn't a better way to resolve a dispute than going to a um, decision. You were with a major and, and, and very successful law firm during a period in which law firms themselves changed enormously. Observations about that? And uh, well, they certainly got a lot bigger. They got bigger. And many of them merged. Right. Um, when I joined Kay Scholler, you, you, uh, uh, if, if you, if you liked, if you enjoyed big firm life, you uh, progressed up through uh, the associate ranks and hopefully became a partner. Occasionally, you were sidetracked into a counsel position. Um, and but that came uh, that was a development that that came mostly in the early 80s where law firms decided that they didn't want to lose very good talent but talent which for a variety of reasons usually financial um, uh, were not going to become partners in the firm um, so you have that development the development of the council position you also had the development of, um, uh, as firms grew, large numbers of associates and very large classes of associates leaving so that you were just left with uh, any place from two to five uh, associates of, out of a class of perhaps 30 to 35 in some years uh, who were left standing uh, with the prospect of becoming partners or counsel. And, and that was a, uh, uh, a, uh, a factor in, in, in the growth of law firms mm -hmm. as well. The types of cases that you handled also um, changed. You know, when I, when I joined Kay Scholler and one of the senior partners asked me about my dad's practice and I said, well, he does some... Uh, uh, personal injury work and he does some bankruptcy work and he does some criminal law work and uh, I got the impression immediately and it, and it was rather rather clear that these were subject areas that a an established uh, prominent law firm in New York City would never touch. Well today uh, the most prominent aspects of practice in many large firms are uh, white-collar criminal work um, which my dad would, would just call criminal practice. Um, bankruptcy is a huge practice area in, in many prominent firms, such as Wild Gotchel, uh, 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 and, and at Kay Scholler. Uh, and um, uh, in terms of uh, the personal injury work that my dad did, well, today it's product liability defense work that uh, really becomes the cash cow for many law firms. Um, so, uh, and bankruptcy, uh, mm -hmm. as I said, is a mainstay. So I guess that uh, sort of proves what, what comes around goes around. I'm not sure that's an apt, uh, apt way of putting it, 
but law firms have changed their focus over the years as well and have embraced um, many of the practice areas that um, uh, years ago, decades ago, were just practiced by, by smaller boutique type law firms mm -hmm. or, or general practitioners, mm -hmm. including intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And, and sort of a geographic spread, too. I mean, I don't know what Kay Scholler did. Well, geographically, uh, the only... Uh, Kay Scholler was always a, a uh, diverse uh, practice, even when it was smaller geographically, because it's especially in the labor it, employment... It took it everywhere. It, it, it took it everywhere. I mean, one of, the, one of the great experiences that I have that I don't think... Uh, young associates have these days is that I actually traveled around the country in connection with collective bargaining and National Labor Relations Board disputes and was able to poke my nose into a variety of workplaces, industrial workplaces, office workplaces. I've been down in coal mines. I've um, uh, been in steel mills that I've represented, auto factories, uh, textile mills, and uh, there are very few textile mm -hmm. mills in the United States, and garment factories in the United States. Um, nothing outside the United States. And of mm -hmm. course, today, large firms do a great deal of work outside the United mm -hmm. States. Although I had, uh, in, in my very active years, many foreign-based clients, non-U.S. clients, with interest in the United mm -hmm. States, which came into the United States uh, for consultations or, or lawsuits um, that involved U.S. personnel uh, where the foreign-based executives um, had such a heavy interest in those cases that I would uh, work with them in, in the U.S. They would travel here. Adidas was one of mm -hmm. them. Uh, the old Metall Gesellschaft, uh, as well as clients from... Uh, uh, Asia and uh, and other places in Europe. You did some pro bono work. Pro bono has always been a mainstay. Um, and uh, one of those activities involved uh, uh, women's equity issues. Yes, yes. Well, as I as I mentioned earlier, uh, my practice is lar was largely on the defense side, except in connection with these interesting police cases that I handled over the years. And on the defense side, um, a, a large number of cases involved women's rights. Um, uh, and I defended uh, large uh, uh, banking institutions as well as industrial uh, uh, companies uh, against the claims of, of uh, discrimination based upon gender. Uh, those that um, had a great deal of merit, I'm proud to say I persuaded my client to settle. And oftentimes they recognized that as the facts unfolded that uh, these were cases that um, uh, maybe not rose to the level of discrimination on the basis of sex as a matter of law, but nonetheless, as a matter of fairness, the employee may not have been treated um, appropriately and, and they would get settled along the way. Occasionally, they would go to court. Um, I, did, I was involved in a number of cases that came to the attention of, of a group uh, that was then called the Now Legal Defense and Education Fund. And years later, I was approached by the then president of uh, Now LDEF, um, who asked me if I would be interested in becoming a trustee, a, a director, a member of the board of directors of, um, of uh, the Legal Defense and Education Fund. And I asked her why, and she explained that she was always impressed with my, um, well, well, with the degree of, of fairness that I treated the cases that she knew of that I was involved in. And also, she was interested, quite frankly, in getting support, financial mm -hmm. support from Kay Scholler. Um, and that, uh, that occurred uh, in 2004. Uh, I also had, at the time, I was active in an organization that had been founded 
by a former deputy secretary of labor under, under President Nixon, uh, Jerry Rossow. It was called Work in America Institute, which was designed to bring together um, leaders from government, um, uh, corporate America, labor unions, and academics in order to uh, in order to solve the problem of productivity in the United States as a competitive matter to ensure that the U.S. would keep jobs here and would grow our industrial um, base uh, uh, rather than uh, shipping jobs out of the country that had just begun. And also to ensure that, that we were creating jobs in the United States as other as as industrial jobs uh, became more automated, um, I mentioned that only because uh, I invited the head of uh, now Legal Defense and Education Fund to join the board of um, the Work in America Institute. I was first general counsel to it, and then became chair. Uh, ultimately, was dissolved uh, because of. Um, uh, it, it, it had run its course after nearly 30 years. Um, and, and so we had a good relationship, uh, or I had a good relationship with the president of, of now Legal Defense and Education Fund, had many things in common. And um, I became a board member in 2004, very much interested in, in their work and um, uh, had been general counsel on a pro bono basis to uh, the Legal Defense and Education Fund until this year, um, 2016, when I stepped down from, from being general counsel, but nonetheless continue on the board of directors and as vice chair. Today it's known as Legal Momentum, the Women's Legal Defense and Education Fund. And we, uh, over the years, I, I worked on a number of very interesting projects. Uh, uh, most recently, um, looking at professional, not professional, excuse me, looking at um, amateur, uh, the way um, women are treated in amateur sports uh, and to ensure that they're treated with a, a degree of equality, a large degree of equality with men. Uh, the most serious problem right now being that um, uh, women uh, soccer players um, who uh, uh, well are, are playing on uh, largely playing on artificial turf, which when they fall as they often do, um, uh, well, at first it's hard on your it's harder on on your on your body on your physique, but also when you fall you you get a lot of Some skin abrasion. burns. Yeah. Uh, whereas FIFA provides uh, uh, real turf mm -hmm. uh, grass. Playing fields for their uh, for their affiliated uh, soccer teams uh, that involve men, mm -hmm. and we're trying to change that. Um, but also uh, cases would um, encompass employment law, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, the treatment of of women um, in connection with um, uh, abuse at home and trying to find cures for that as well, both through the courts and uh, uh, federal agencies, as well as um, uh, through the use of persuasion in education. Um, it, it's a wonderful organization, um, and I'm very proud to have worked with it. And so you may be saying to yourself, well, how did your corporate clients look at all this? If you, can, can you straddle both sides? Well, actually, all of my corporate clients, uh, when I first joined the board, I went to a number of them and, and mm -hmm. said, look, I, I'm planning to join this board. Do you have any difficulty with it? Oh, absolutely not, Jay. We applaud your being involved because after all, we support women. We never want to discriminate against women. It's only those oddball cases that uh, we call you for to help us resolve um, their misunderstandings. Um, whether or not their characterization is accurate really is irrelevant, but they did support my work, and I'm very, mm -hmm. very pleased that they did over the years. I've had a ball. Great. You've been a devoted citizen of the university. 
in all kinds of ways. Um, could you talk a bit about how that has happened? Or I'd be happy to. Yeah. Plus, it, it goes back to my being so grateful for the way the ILR school treated me and inviting me over. And you know, back then I didn't mention before, but being from New Jersey, uh, back when I joined the ILR school, I transferred from arts to ILR, it was not an easy move uh, because about 85%, I may be exaggerating a few percents um, high or low, but about 85% of its budget was covered by the state of New York. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the late 60s, or, or mid-60s, excuse me. And um, it only was permitted some six slots um, for out-of-state students. Uh, and fortunately, someone left uh, who was out-of-state, and they accepted me to join uh, their, uh, their student body, which I did in the spring of uh, uh, 19... 1965, um, and I was just so grateful for the treatment by the IOR faculty and, and uh, how welcoming they were and, and uh, uh, just so gracious in, in the way they treated me and the wonderful education that I had through teachers like Milton Kovitz and Kurt Hanslow and, and Professor Vin Muller and, and uh, Alice Cook uh, um, and Jean McKelvey. Um, that uh, uh, why wouldn't I want to give back to Cornell as, as much as it gave me? And then when I got to law school and got a wonderful legal education here, and when I ran into some financial uh, problems, Dean Warren stepped in, and, and um, there's just no way mm -hmm. that uh, Cornell would not be something I would keep in my heart forever. Mm -hmm. oh, that's glorious. Uh, also, I enjoy interactions with, well, young, with young people, exactly. and that uh, uh, Cornell's a good source of that, an excellent source of that. On January of this year, you opened a new chapter um, that I'm a bit curious about. Have you always been a dog fancier? I've always loved dogs. They always have made me smile, but I have to admit that I've, in terms of the animal world uh, at the Wax household, we've never had anything larger than a gerbil uh, as the kids grow, grew up. Um, we're not dog people, but I, uh, for, for, for some 19 years, I happen to represent the American Kennel Club when they've had some difficult issues to work out, and they'd call upon me from time to time in my private practice at Kay Scholler. The, uh, uh, it, it, I had represented for some 25 years uh, J.P. Morgan and Company, the old J.P. Morgan before its merger with Chase, and uh, had a wonderful relationship with uh, the, the uh, then chair of the board of directors of American Kennel Club, um, who was a senior executive at J.P. Morgan. And uh, he brought me in to help resolve some problems some 19 years ago. Uh, and from time to time after that, um, others had called me in. And, and I knew the people at, J at uh, uh, the American Kennel Club quite well. And they called me at the end of 2015, just as I was finishing my last case for Kay Scholler, a huge case. Um, that I was heading up. And uh, uh, I, I had retired from Kay Scholler, technically retired, had stayed on for a year as special counsel to conclude this case, um, and uh, was really wasn't looking forward to having to figure out what, I was what my next chapter was going to be. And fortuitously, American Kennel Club called in December of 2015 and said, um, uh, we, we need a general counsel, and we were thinking of you. Um, would you like to join us? You know us, we know you. Of course, I'm condensing the story a bit. Uh, and so I began there in January of 2015 as uh, senior executive vice president and general counsel of the American Kennel Club. So I'm only in my sixth month now of working with 
American Kennel Club. I now understand fully what the general and general counsel means. I practice very little employment law, some. Most of it is intellectual property, corporate, real estate, finance. Um, and uh, Same kind of diversity your dad knew. Yes, well, exactly. <laughs> I even am involved in some personal injury matters. Um, the American Kennel Club is a not-for-profit, but it's, it's um, uh, starting to enter into the realm of for-profit businesses through limited liability corporations uh, in connection with products and services that are related to the world of dogs, such as pet care centers, mm. um, and, uh, uh, but also in, um, in connection with the digital world, uh, we're trying to develop a pet collar that would, um, a, a dog collar uh, that will uh, be able to ultimately uh, monitor the health of the dog as well as the location and even have a beam of light such as that that you'd have when you turn the flashlight on on your uh, um, iPhone um, that will help you locate your dog should it be running around your backyard or in the neighbor's backyard. Um, so uh, that brings me into the world of intellectual property and and corporate and finance as we as we work through the problems of starting up new businesses. Um, it's also kind of interesting, and I never really touched on this much when I was doing work uh, on occasion for for American Kennel Club. It brings me into the uh, the mainstay world of uh, dog events um, and competitions and. Uh, American Kennel Club also has its own, and I never really focused on this before, has its own code of conduct, um, which you could class as a criminal code. And if either dogs or humans who are controlling those dogs break the rules, they will be penalized. And if they want to appeal, the appeal is to a trial board made up of uh, judges who are very experienced and learned in the world of, 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 uh, of dogs. Um, uh, it uh, presented a somewhat humorous um, uh, uh, initiation for me because shortly after I joined American Kennel Club, I went to my first trial uh, before a three-person board of, of judges. Um, my deputy general counsel was the prosecuting attorney. The uh, 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 the defendant um, was uh, uh, a woman who um, was a co-owner of a prized dog uh, whom she wanted to mate with a sire in another state. Her co-owner opposed the mating because she felt that the sire was not raised under, appropriate con under healthy conditions, mm -hmm. and she objected. Nonetheless, the defendant in this case went ahead and forged the co-owner's name um, with the AKC in order to mate the dog um, uh, out, of, out of state. And um, that led to these uh, quasi-criminal charges in, in, our, in our own private world. Well, there I am at the hearing at 8 o'clock in the morning in Atlanta in a... In the, um, uh, a, uh, a, a room at a hotel, and uh, the chief judge of the trial board opens the record. There's a stenographer taking down all names. It's like a, 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 real, a real trial. And this sounds very interesting. I thought to myself, I never realized the formality that uh, these things take. But within a couple of minutes of opening the case, uh, the trial judge, who was a female, started talking about, now, who owns the bitch? And um, all of a sudden, everyone's talking about the bitch. Now, as an employment <laughs> lawyer, as an employment litigator, I, uh, when I hear someone raise the, uh, the, uh, the, the word bitch, my ears perk up and I say, oh my goodness, this is a, uh, this is a very serious employment matter, but not in the world of dogs, where 
talking about bitches is, a, is an everyday event. And so it went. The case ultimately settled, though. My big contribution was whispering to, after uh, the opening statements from both sides, whispering to my deputy that, uh, gee, this is something that um, I don't think the uh, defendant really wants to go through. Maybe you should take a few minutes out and speak with her a little bit further. Uh, my deputy had made an effort to resolve the case before trial, but uh, uh, met with, uh, with um, uh, objection, uh, uh, but it did so. But they saw the objection softened in the face of the actual yes. event. Yes, yeah. yes. So uh, I've gotten into these internal trials as um, also it's a unique organization because unlike the corporate world, where occasionally I would have to make presentations before the board of directors as to the nature of a case, typically a cl potential class action, involving very serious issues of employment law that would have public relations implications uh, that the board was interested in. And you'd sit before one of these august boards and, and of, of people from various walks of life and various industrial backgrounds and legal backgrounds, a uh, lot different in the dog world. Um, the American Kennel Club has some 4,000 to 5,000, I may be exaggerating a bit, uh, member clubs around the country. Some of these clubs are breed-based, such as a dachshund-based club, or, or um, uh, uh, a terrier-based, or, or a groupings, uh, a, a dog groupings club, such as terriers, um, uh, or a, a, a functional club, such as um, a, a hound-based club, or a retriever-based club. Um, uh, and uh, each of these clubs, though, is entitled to send a delegate to a delegate body. And about three to 400 uh, delegates meet um, four times a year uh, for two days of meetings. And in fact, the meetings begin this weekend for, uh, for one of these quarterly meetings. And uh, the delegate body, though, is um, analogous to the shareholders. They vote on uh, changes to the charter of the American Kennel Club. The American Kennel Club goes back to the 1800s, late 1800s, when some very prominent uh, families in, in uh, largely in New York and elsewhere in, in the East uh, got together and, and created a uh, uh, American Kennel Club in order to uh, provide for the sport of, of uh, dog events and, and uh, for um, uh, purebred dogs. Mm -hmm. Uh, today, of course, the American Kennel Club includes, um, in some of its events anyway, um, mixed breed dogs. Uh, but back to its governance, um, the uh, delegate body then elects 13, uh, uh, from, its, from its group, 13 uh, directors. And that becomes the board of directors of the American Kennel Club. And uh, the remaining eight months of the year, we have two days of meetings each month for the directors of the American Kennel Club. And they are my boss, mm -hmm. um, uh, or bosses. Uh, and so you spend a lot of time during each month preparing for those two days of meetings and um, then dissecting and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, having post-meeting sessions uh, with assignments of, uh, of uh, looking at things like, can we create an arbitration system or a dispute resolution system to resolve some of the disputes that uh, the local clubs may have with its members or uh, between members. Um, uh, also, the code of conduct uh, is, is looked at periodically and, and we try to advise on, on changes there. Um, most of their work deals with, with events, um, dog events around the country, uh, and the dog events that the Amer American Kennel Club itself puts on, a national show mm -hmm. in Florida in uh, December, um, and uh, uh, a, uh, an event, a large event in New York City, which you ought to come to sometime, called Meet the Breeds. Um, it's a two-day event in, in Manhattan, um, at which um, 
the American Kennel Club is, is able to attract a number of breeders of anywhere from 125 to nearly 200 breeds of dogs uh, to exhibit the dogs and answer questions from the public about the dogs. It's conducted on two piers in the Hudson River and uh, it's a lot of fun and, and uh, there's some events uh, going on as well uh, that uh, the, uh, I, I think, I'm, I don't think I'm exaggerating to say some 45,000 or so people attend. It may even be a multiple mm -hmm. of that. So it's, it's an educational rather than a competitive. Um, well, except for yeah. the national event yeah. that they put on, yeah. which is a competitive event, yeah. and it's a it's a yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it it does serve a lot of educational purposes. Yeah. Some beautiful artwork in our offices yeah. as well um, that's been donated to the American Kennel Club over the years. You should visit me sometime. All right, we'll get the cooks tour. Uh, but it's a lot of fun, and dogs make me smile. And and uh, retirement's not in my DNA, so. Uh, it was just, the, 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 uh, as I said, fortuitous, um, and I'm a very fortunate person. Sounds fascinating. It is. Yeah. I, uh, I've run to the end of my questions, Jay. Are there any things that you'd like to talk about that we haven't uh, covered? I, I think you've touched on everything that uh, I can imagine that, uh, uh, that's reminiscent of my of, of, uh, of Cornell Law School and my role over the years as an alumni. I have to say, Peter, that um, one of the greatest joys as an alum of Cornell Law School has, has obviously helping to advise the dean or at least mm -hmm. thinking that I'm helping to advise the dean, um, the then dean of, uh, or the, uh, the existing dean uh, of, of, the, of the law school, teams change every, every, uh, uh, every decade. But um, interacting with law students, you can call it mentoring, um, who might be interested in my area of law or in big firm law versus small firm law, but particular, particularly the minority students. The students who may not have had a father in, uh, or an uncle uh, or anyone um, in their frame of reference who had a legal background, but who thinks that their interest in practicing law um, has, has really been uh, a joy. Uh, and I'm talking now not just about law students, but also about undergraduate students um, uh, and putting together with experts in the fields of, of, of their interests. Sometimes it's entertainment law, sometimes employment, which I can help them with. Uh, other times uh, with corporate or finance. Um, it, it really is, is something that I was fortunate to fall into. Uh, and I had my mentors um, uh, among professors in, in the law school, but uh, in trying to pay it forward, I guess, mm -hmm. is the expression, has been a great joy. Also, to, um, to occasionally work with professors in the law school keeps you on your toes and uh, uh, also brings a smile to my face. And I've been very fortunate to have been included in activities that have brought me, in, uh, brought me into, uh, well, have made it easy for me to interact with, with uh, the wonderful professors at Cornell Law School. Thank you very much. My pleasure.